Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Hi, Shay. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. I'm very excited to talk with you and to share your story and journey in general uh, because it's very I don't want to say unique because I think so many other people share a similar journey as you, but I think that there's some pieces you bring to the table that aren't readily talked about, but very important. Yeah. I'm excited to talk about it because I found that when I do like on social media or I've talked about it at med schools and stuff like that, people, they appreciate the the different parts of it and how, how I, they can relate to it. I feel like I have a a lot to my story. So there's a lot for people to to relate to. You are not only a patient that experiences endometriosis and have gone through the treatments, but you also are involved in the field of endometriosis, hoping to further the research. So can you talk a little bit about who you are and the projects that you're involved in? I just recently turned 21 and I'm a master's of psychology student. Essentially through my program, I get to do a thesis on kind of whatever I want. When I was originally diagnosed with endo, I realized there's a lack of research just kind of all around endo in general, but it was pretty abysmal in terms of anything related to psychology. Um, And the few studies that are out there aren't conducted in the United States. And so, yeah, they're kind of generalizable to people with endo, but there's going to be different cultural and, you know, socioeconomic factors and that kind of thing. And so I'm currently researching the impact of a couple different like sociological, psychological factors um, on the experience of living with endo. So that can include like childhood trauma, um, cultural beliefs around like menstruation and motherhood, infertility, gender identity, sexual orientation, because all of those things can have a pretty big impact. Um, but especially related to sexual and gender identity, because it is kind of like seen as even though it's a kind of a full body disease, it's seen as like a reproductive disease. And so mm-hmm. when you don't fall into the heteronormative cisgender, you know, norm of what an endo patient is, that can definitely make treatment a little bit tricky, at least, you know, both in like the actual medical treatments, but also how you were just treated as a person by people in the medical community. I'm currently um, still recruiting participants and it's just a brief online survey and pretty much you just have to be between 18 to 50 years old, uh, surgically diagnosed with endo and uh, currently residing in the United States and we're assigned female at birth. That's because we know that, you know, people assigned male at birth can develop endo, but that's, you know, a small, at least as far as we know right now, is a pretty small portion of who who has endo. So yeah, that's what what I'm focusing on right now. Outside of school, I work as a sexual assault emergency responder. I am neurodivergent. I'm non-binary. I'm in a queer relationship. I think that's that covers me. I have seen Shay for maybe a little over a year now. Of course, not every single week. We've spent some significant time together and it started with endometriosis. Well, probably not really, but at least your first diagnosis was endometriosis. And then it Mm -hmm. shifted into, or at least came about that you were also dealing with neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, which we heard about last week with Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Paul Young and some of the research coming up. So we wanted to share the story to put that in context of what that looks like in real life and somebody's experience going through that because there are so many similarities in these diagnoses. So do you want to start kind of from the beginning, Shay, and tell us what where it all started? Yeah, yeah. So I usually trace it back to when I was 11. It was my first day of sixth grade um, when I had my first period. And um, from like that first one, it was like really painful. My mom had really painful periods. And so she was, she understood it and she was definitely empathetic and compassionate about it. It, Because I know some people will be like, oh, well, that's normal. That's fine. You just have to suck it up. But like she understood it and she was compassionate about it. 
but it kind of just progressively got worse. And then to kind of tie in the vestibular adenia is, you know, with that first period, I tried using a tampon and it just didn't work for me. It, it wasn't, I don't remember it being like extremely painful. I think probably because I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like very right. quickly, I didn't try that hard to do it. You know, as time went on into like middle school and high school, I continued to have worse periods. And so my pediatrician put me on birth control the first time, I believe when I was 12. And I tried like a variety of pills growing up. Um, but we learned pretty quickly well, I guess not super quickly, um, but anything that was a mixed pill with uh, progesterone and estrogen specifically, I developed chronic migraines from, and I had to see like a bunch of neurologists. I got like MRIs because I was having these like crazy headaches and migraines. And so we figured that out, thankfully. Um, But then I eventually saw a pediatric gynecologist. And that was the first time that pelvic exams were attempted. Keyword attempted. Yeah, exactly. And it was just like unbelievably painful. And it, you know, quickly became a very traumatic experience for me. And so that was when endo was brought up, but they didn't want to do the surgery to diagnose it yet because I was, in their eyes, I was too young. I think I was like probably 14, 13, 14 at that point. So it's just like, we're just going to keep treating with birth control. And then there wasn't really any more thoughts about the, you know, exam or tampon type pain until I was like 15, 16, because they knew that I couldn't do the exams. And so when I was 15, I had a hymenectomy and had my first IUD placed and that was done under anesthesia. So I, I do know that they for sure like knew that they wouldn't have been able to do that with me awake and conscious of like the pain that I was experiencing. But when I was 16, they kind of, kind of diagnosed me with lichen sclerosis. There, that I later learned that you're supposed to do like biopsies and other more like physical tests for that. Um, But they really just, you know, I had a family history of it, but anyone in my family who had it had it post menopause. So it did it didn't really make total sense. But they're like, it kind of looks like you have it. And I was experiencing what I thought was a lot of yeast infections from like itchiness and just general like pain. um, That was outside of when it was like, aggravated in a sense like from an exam or from a tampon being like trying to put a tampon in something like that so then I was on topical steroids for that but that I was on that for like three years and nothing ever helped with that but it was just kind of like maybe I just have to be on these steroids forever I don't know like they didn't really have like an answer for it did you get more irritated during that time after having this topical steroids for so long Um, I would definitely take breaks. I don't like specifically recall it like getting worse, but I do know that I would take breaks from it. And so that could have been from, you know, just it being like, because it was uncomfortable for me to apply. I think that was probably the most likely thing. um, Because, you know, anything, trying to do anything down there was just really uncomfortable. It wasn't necessarily painful because I kind of unintentionally really avoided the vestibule, I now realize, like, I I kind of subconsciously knew, okay, that is the no-no zone sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) regardless, I still had a lot of itchiness and pain. So I think it probably did aggravate it, but I didn't necessarily connect the dots fully. Yeah. That makes sense. Before you move on to the next part of your story, there's already so many questions I have. Mm -hmm. When you first went in and and they decided to send you to a pediatric gynecologist. That doesn't happen for so many people. I think sometimes we have to educate patients, even as adults, you know, ask for a pediatric speculum. So I think that's a really interesting, unique piece of the puzzle. Most of the time, these people are being seen by their mom's gynecologist. Was there a difference in how that pediatric gynecologist spoke with you, handled your case compared to an adult? gynecologist? So I was really lucky in terms of of being referred to like a specialist because the 
pediatrician I saw, I saw from the time I was two weeks old. So I really mm-hmm. trusted her and I really respected her and I still like love her. Um, and so that was like a, she was kind of hands off with it. I know that a lot of pediatricians or like people who are their frontline doctor, like their family physician are going to try things that they probably aren't the most qualified to do. Um, mm-hmm. But she was pretty hands off and was like, I just go <laughs> see a gynecologist. And I think that um, I, from having seen a gynecologist as an adult, I've noticed that there was a lot more of an emphasis on like sex education as a teenager. Mm. Like there wasn't really like a lot of it kind of went to like, oh, well, you're not having sex. So this isn't an issue. When I was younger, it was like they would try to like push these like push like things about birth control and education and that kind of stuff. But they kind of saw a lot of things as a non issue because mm-hmm. I wasn't sexually active and they definitely still you know like I received treatment for like the endo symptoms and that kind of stuff but in terms of for the internal exams it was like they would attempt and there was always an attempt it was never like oh we can skip it today even though like last time and the last four times before that like you showed that you had pain yeah <laughs> um I think and there was also a lot more hesitation for different forms of treatment like when I saw my you know Spring Robinson my big endo specialist she kind of jumped in immediately and was like we're gonna get this taken care of you're having excision next month we're doing all these tests like she was really quick to like listen to the symptoms and do something about it whereas when I had a pediatrician there was a lot of hesitancy about any form of surgery about any kinds of treatment outside of just birth control. When I was 17, she did eventually say that I should do pelvic floor PT. Um, but that didn't come up before that. At some point you, you mentioned you were offered surgery or surgery was mentioned though. It wasn't really Mm -hmm. pushed because of your age. Did they talk at all about what that surgery would look like, what they would do? So yeah. So that's something that I, I still hold a lot of resentment about. (laughs) When it was first brought up, it was like, it's a keyhole surgery, and we'll look in there and see if, you know, you have endo, and then if you do, we'll do an ablation. And they didn't really explain what that was, and that happened when I was 18, eventually, but it was first brought up, you know, like, early on of, like, this is what we could do, but, like, your symptoms aren't bad enough, or, like, we don't, we don't think we'll find anything because you're so young. Like it hasn't had enough time to develop, but I wasn't fully aware of what the options were and the importance of having a specialist. That's, that's Mm -hmm. kind of like the, the big thing is like, I wish she had been educated on all the options and shared all those options with me. And I now know having had that surgery and stuff that she wasn't the qualified person to do it. And so acknowledging that and and putting me onto a specialist would have been a much better course of action, I think. Absolutely. And we can come back to that a little bit later on in your story. Curious for people, well, I thought it was helpful to have other people hear that because you don't always see what that looks like. Um, and But then when you do, it looks very similar to that kind of situation. So yeah. the traumatic pelvic exams kind of already started. And I'd be curious to know a little bit to, there were several attempts, like you said, it wasn't, there wasn't an option to sort of let's skip it this time because of last time. Did you start developing kind of a fear of going to the doctor or how did you feel about those appointments? Were you excited for more or new information? Were you starting to feel discouraged? Can you share a little bit about that? So I didn't from what I remember, I didn't really start to develop a fear and like, you know, spoiler alert, PTSD (laughs) symptoms until actually my first appointment with Spring Robinson. Because I grew up being a very sick kid. I was in and Mm -hmm. out of doctor's offices all the time for various different issues. Um, You know, allergies, asthma, um, I had chronic eye issues, I had, you know, the endo symptoms, I had, there was 
all of this stuff happening. So from a very young age, I was very used to doctors and I mm-hmm. trusted doctors and um, it was taught to me to trust doctors. And so I just, I didn't really develop the the kind of panicky type symptoms until later on. Mm-hmm. I was still, for, for a while when I was a teenager, as things progressively got worse with my endo symptoms, I recall being more excited than scared because I thought like, okay, we'll try something new or I'll learn something new or I've had these new symptoms. So maybe this will explain something like I kind of went into a lot of those appointments expecting more than I came out of. And I was disappointed probably a lot of the times that I walked out because there would still be these things. And sometimes they would have answers for things, but it didn't totally make sense. But again, I was still, I was a young person who grew up with doctors and trusting doctors. So I just kind of took them at their word for it and was like, okay, I guess this is what I should be doing or based off of these things and A, B, and C sort of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. So 17, we're at 17 now, brought up surgery again, it sounds like. Yeah, so what had led to that was... When I was in high school, it just progressively got worse. Kind of the the big event that occurred in high school was the first time I fainted. Um, I was in chemistry class and I was on my period and I was anemic from blood loss and I was in a lot of pain. And uh, my, you know, childhood best friend, Tally, she was with me in that class, which is why I kind of know more about, this isn't my recollection of anything. It's what I've been told what happened. But she picked me up and we had to walk up two flights of stairs to the nurse's office. And I was so like dissociated. I don't know if it was because I was in pain, if it was, you know, just I just checked out. I don't really know what happened. But when we got up to the first flight of stairs, I just kept walking and walked like straight into a wall. Like I was so Mm. out of it and I would throw up. I missed a lot of school. I ended up doing like kind of a a different program starting when I was 16 um, for school because like I just couldn't do the eight hour five days a week consistently. That just didn't didn't work for me and, and for a variety of reasons, but mainly because of the amount of pain I was in and it wasn't well controlled at school because like I couldn't bring meds to school I had I was in the nurse's office all the time I had doctor's appointments that you know are during the school day so I missed a lot of school for that and so you know that was when the surgery was brought up again but it was like okay well I was gonna be going to college and Mm -hmm. COVID had started and it was, you know, those kinds of surgeries just weren't really happening. And so it was brought up, but it was like, sorry, like, <laughs> don't, we're not doing that right now. Um, Because it was considered, you know, an elective surgery, which I think yeah. a lot of people elective. experienced during COVID. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and during COVID, my symptoms worsened again. I now know, you know, from Spring Robinson that like, she's explained to me that since COVID, people's endo has been like reoccurring faster and they're having surgery more frequently just from the stress of everything. And so I had the IUD, but I started having breakthrough bleeding um, Mm -hmm. during COVID. When I moved home from, I only went to move to college for about three months until I moved home because it just wasn't worth it to be here, you know, because it was online school and all that jazz. So it was when I came home and it was like right before my 19th birthday is when I did ultimately have the ablation and how that came up was because I was having the breakthrough bleeding and they felt that my IUD wasn't working anymore. Um, which she said is, I, I don't know if this is true to be honest, but can be relatively common in people with endo where the IUDs just don't seem to work as long as they're supposed to um because I'd only had mine for like three four years at that point so she was like okay well we have to put you under anesthesia to change out your IUD you're gonna be you know you're 18 now so you know I would be comfortable doing a laparoscopy or an ablation while you're already under anesthesia to do the IUD so it wasn't like 
oh, let's plan this completely separate procedure. It was like, okay, well, we have to go in anyway, so might as well just do it while you're in there. And that makes sense. And I don't know, with the IUD, especially in those with heavy periods, you can have that anyways. It doesn't stop you from ovulating. And so it's hit or miss. I had no period for four years. And then the last year on my first IUD, I've never had heavy periods. So I experienced that at the end of it. My second one, I had kind of spotting regularly from the beginning. It's been kind of all over the place, but I could definitely see in those with heavy bleeding, whether it's due to endo or adenomyosis or fibroids, if they had an IUD, it could be normal because it's not stopping your cycle. But that's interesting that she kind of pinned it to endo or it's stopping working. So, and and thankfully my mom was relatively educated on endo too. We had people in my family, like cousins and that kind of stuff. Like it wasn't, my mom thinks that she may have it, but she never, you know, tested or had anything. It was mainly just because we had similar symptoms. The Mm -hmm. main difference is that she didn't have pain and symptoms outside of her period. Whereas I like reached a point that it was constant. And yeah, so then we went in to change out the IUD. And this was in um, like mid 2021. During, you know, they did the ablation, they changed out the IUD. And I woke up, I, I always like to tell this part, because this is something that I always relate to when other people with endo share it, is waking up and being like, did you find anything? Like, that was like the first thought in my brain was like, tell me I'm not crazy, basically. Absolutely. And I, I guess I, I don't remember this, but I, I woke up like multiple times and would like forget that they had already told me. And like every time I would just start sobbing, crying. And I'd be like, I wasn't crazy. Like I knew I wasn't crazy because it's, it's difficult because, you know, I am so thankful that my mom believed me growing mm-hmm. up, but you know, other people members didn't, teachers didn't, some doctors didn't. I had to face a lot of ableism, to be honest, in terms of people because they couldn't see it, they didn't believe it. And you still, there will be times when you still feel like I am crazy, like I'm in so much pain and no one else seems to like understand it or believe me. And so that was like a really kind of big moment for me. Yeah, so then at that point, I was diagnosed with stage one endo. If I recall correctly, they only found it really like around the uterus area. I'm going to hypothesize that that may be the only places that they looked. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, like around like the uterus, the peritoneal, like cavity area. Mm -hmm. um, Those are really the only places I remember them saying that they found anything. That recovery was like pretty okay for the most part. The only kind of complication that I had was um, they used like glue to close my incisions instead of like stitches. And I had a big reaction to those. (laughs) Yeah, those are fun. uh, Yeah, that was another good old fainting moment for me. I trying to like I had I basically like had to peel off the glue myself. And that was very uncomfortable and also gross. So (laughs) I just like completely, yeah, that, that was that. And that was funny because I think that was a day that like my dad kind of was like, Oh, something's actually wrong with you. (laughs) Cause I remember like, (laughs) I like peeled it off. I started to faint and my mom was in there and then I was like throwing up everywhere and he came in and he was like, Oh, that's gross. (laughs) Like, and then like left. Cause my dad, like I, love him to death he just didn't get it growing up Mm -hmm. he didn't and you know I think that's gonna be very common for you know anybody like guys just aren't gonna get it unfortunately and like I said that's why I feel so lucky that my mom did because I did have someone in my family who was really advocating for me but that there's been a couple moments along the line where I've my dad kind of has these like oh that really sucks (laughs) for you kind of moments yeah they really gotta see it to believe it Exactly. And so when I was fainting and covered in like vomit, which by the way, sorry, gross, that was gross, but like I was, and he could see how irritated the incisions were. And like, it was a very much like, 
that that's a that's a good way to put it he really had to like see it and that was a that was a pretty extreme <laughs> mm-hmm. example of, of what it can look like yeah that's quite the experience and it, something that I kind of found interesting and you mentioned coming out of the anesthesia but falling asleep and waking up and saying the same thing it's like you got to relive that validation several times over which is which is kind of cool and that was kind of one of the 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 first times that we learned about like some of my weird complications with anesthesia that it's really hard for them to put me under and then they give me like a lot more than maybe someone like my size would normally get and so it usually takes me a while to come out of it and I am usually like pretty confused and um, which I think anybody is but my understanding is that they kind of give me pretty crazy amounts that um, and that was like the first time that really came up. Yeah, I mean, I've witnessed your anesthesia experience, which I can yeah. share about uh, <laughs> later on in your history. Anyone listening that has experience with odd anesthesia would love to hear your story too and, and putting in in the comments. But it's been a fascinating aspect of your care to really understand why. I mean, we can talk more about that mm-hmm. later. But if anyone has insights as to the reasons why people that have maybe some mast cell disorders or endo, it'd be very interesting to hear. You know, having the big reaction to the glue was another like kind of first time I, because I always had like allergy type stuff growing up, but that was a, that was a pretty strange one. Cause you know, they, the doctors always ask, Oh, are you allergic to any medication? Mm -hmm. Are you allergic to, you know, any like types of gloves or anything like that? And I never had any issues with any sort of medical like equipment or medication or anything until that point in time and so then you know I had that summer that recovery was pretty easy especially now comparing it to excision surgery like I was you know I still hung out in bed for a couple weeks I was bloated I felt kind of gross but like I recall getting back to it like pretty quickly um I Mm -hmm. still had like remaining soreness and I still had a lot of endo symptoms but the way that my doctor explained it to me was like you know we she did say like we burned the tissue inside of you so you're gonna have irritation and so I'm now looking back it's like okay then why did you do that (laughs) yeah exactly Um, did any of your symptoms improve after that surgery no and I I would go as far to say that most of them got worse Mm -hmm. interesting that your recovery was easier and you know the way that like I think about it is like with excision like they're taking pieces out of you it was a lot longer it was a lot more extensive and my mom has always said you know like once you're out like doctors aren't necessarily gentle (laughs) you know like they're they're gonna do their job whatever means it has so I had a lot of like abdominal bruising and that kind of stuff so I think it's it's yeah. just in general a, a more major surgery than an ablation, especially because the ablation seems to have been kept to a pretty small area, whereas the excision was a lot more extensive and like widespread. Yeah. Well, then following that summer, you came back to San Diego. Yes. Yeah. So I moved back to San Diego. I was just like, you know, I, I don't remember if I was on birth control, like I, I, in addition to, cause there was multiple periods, like during all the IUDs that I've had that I've also been on a pill. So I don't recall during that time if I was also on a pill. Um, I may have been because the idea may have been to, you know, stop the bleeding that occurs after an IUD being placed, but I don't really remember that. But like my symptoms just like kept getting worse and, like with food sensitivities specifically that was getting pretty bad where I was just having a lot of like gastrointestinal type stuff which had always been an issue but it just seemed to get worse and like things that I could eat before weren't fine anymore and my pain outside of periods was also increasing which was like when I'm living on my own for the first time in a new place and I'm going to college And the heat was like a huge thing for me. Like it was a really rough transition. And with the heat too is I kind of saw a bit of a spike with the vestibulodynia pain where I just remember like I'd be walking around campus and it would just, it heat does not mix well, Mm -hmm. at least with, in my experience, 
so burny and so itchy and like in between classes I would walk to the Trader Joe's on campus and get like a bag of frozen peas <laughs> and like go sit in my car for like 20 minutes and then I would like go to class like it was just like the that transition period was really hard on my body yeah and um and that's what prompted me to see who I thought was an endo specialist <laughs> in October of that of that year Yes, tell us about that experience. Jandra knows a lot about this. <laughs> we spent a lot of time uh, talking about this person. Um, but I saw someone here in San Diego who is, you know, the head of a big endometriosis care center is like kind of what it's labeled as. He had like pretty good reviews. Um, and so I was just like, okay, well, I need like I'm an adult now. I'm not living in Seattle anymore. I can't see my other kind of person I was seeing as like my endo specialist. So I'm like, okay, I want to get established with someone down here, especially since my symptoms are worsening. And so I had this appointment and the office I now know is more fertility based. Like there was a lot of pictures of babies everywhere <laughs> and yeah. a lot of pamphlets related to different infertility type treatments. Again, like this guy has pretty good reviews and and it sucks because I was really young and I didn't have any family down here. I only had a couple of friends. I hadn't met my partner yet. And so I was really just like kind of putting my faith in into something and kind of hoping for the best. And mm -hmm. that appointment like in full honesty was like very positive for me. It was like the first time like you know, I just said to a doctor I don't want an ultrasound. I don't want to attempt at a pelvic exam. And they like listened and there wasn't like this weird pressure to like prove that I experienced pain. Mm -hmm. And him and the medical student that was with him were like very understanding of my symptoms and very like empathetic to it. Essentially said, you know, you had this surgery and I don't remember if he specifically said anything about ablation, like not being the best fit, but it was like, he seemed to kind of look at surgery in general as not being a good treatment. And so, you know, and I had just come out of having the surgery and didn't have like the best experience and like my symptoms hadn't really improved. And so he kind of said the golden words of like, I'm going to give you a medication so you never have to have surgery again. And so, again, as a young person who had been dealing with this forever, I was like, perfect. This is great. Mm -hmm. Like, I just had to pop a pill every day. Like, that's like, that's exactly Easy. what I'm looking for. I think some of that comes from the knowledge you have after. What you had shared with me was he approached it as you've already had a surgery and it didn't work. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, he was like, there's this pill. It's like newly FDA approved. Um, I've seen it work like wonders. I remember him saying about how like it's really expensive and most insurances don't cover it. And so like how to contact the pharmaceutical company to get like a like a a payment card that made it like five dollars or something like made it a lot cheaper, which I know like people it is usually expensive for people. So I don't know if they just don't have access to the that card or whatever. Um, and then the last thing that he shared with me was like, oh, and also like some of my colleagues are doing research on it um, and like you get paid for it. And so if you want to like do it, like contact this person or like maybe they took my info and were like these people will contact you. Um, and so, yeah, I walked out of that appointment with a prescription for Orlissa. <laughs> and thinking this is going to be the treatment that works. Yeah, like this is going to be like, life changing and I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna have pain every day and I'm going to, you know, be able to eat again and go to the bathroom consistently and not have it be painful. And, you know, it, it I remember walking out of that with like a lot of like hope. And, mm -hmm. and so that, that really sucks, like, you know, retrospectively. And there's so much to that appointment for you and knowing you you were there by yourself in a male doctor's office talking about something that you've been trying to attack for many years with 
disappointment and the wrong treatment and not getting help. And I think that's really important to highlight because we talk a lot about gaslighting and just changes that physicians can make in better education. I think the scariest scenario is the ones that don't understand or have alternative intentions that don't gaslight you. Because how do you know the difference? Yeah, exactly. It's funny because like looking back, like I feel like there's things in the universe that were like telling me not to do it because I had to like fight with my insurance company. I had to order it from a pharmacy in Oregon because like I, for whatever reason, like couldn't access it in California. Um, and, and it took like a good, like at least two or three weeks for it to like finally land on my doorstep kind of thing. And, and again, it's like looking back, it was like, oh, like, why didn't I take that as like a sign? And yeah, so then I took the medication. I had a couple, I had one follow up that I remember actually speaking to him I think other times were just like messages over my chart, like, hey, how you doing sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And that was in January. It was like my three month ish mark of being on it. And the only side effects that I had noticed were hot flashes. And I remember that being really the only thing that he had mentioned to me because I, you know, I don't, I'm a lot more careful about asking about side effects now. So I'm not sure if I did at the time, but he should have said it to me regardless of whether or not I asked. And if it was something like bigger than hot flashes, I would have remembered it. Um, So the only thing that he had mentioned was like, oh, you might get like a little bit of hot flashes. And so that was really the only thing that I noticed experiencing. Like I may have had other side effects that like I was cognizant of, but may not have realized that they were side effects aside from the hot flashes. I think that's just important to note that if somebody were to tell you there could be bone loss or, you know, depression, significant mental health, a lot of the more actually common side effects, I think it's just telling that you don't even remember that conversation. Because those are some big things that I think many people, even people that are, aren't, you know, beyond a high school education, you're, you are a college educated person, you've dealt with this, I think anybody would be like, oh, I don't want that. And, and at least remember that conversation. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, any symptoms that I had hadn't improved. And I remember specifically reporting like, nothing's different. And they they basically saying like, you know, it has to build up in your system was kind of the idea behind it. And I was thinking, okay, well, I've been on like mental health medications before. And that was usually the case. Like you had to be on it for a while for it to like, you know, really take effect in your system. So I was like, okay, that like makes sense in the records of that meeting, having like reviewed it and stuff. They reported that I said that I experienced improvements. I know that I wouldn't have said that because I didn't. Um, And they also didn't report any side effects that I had. And and I did specifically say that I had hot flashes. Mm -hmm. And you continued to seek care after that. Thus, why would you report that you had improvement when you then continued on seeking help? Yeah. And so when I had moved here, I decided to go back to acupuncture. And so that's when I met Merit. And I've been seeing Merit pretty consistently, I think, since that fall. And it was around like March or April that, you know, I had been seeing her specifically because like, you know, she specializes in endo and reproductive health and, you know, she has her own experiences with it. And so I remember asking her, I was like, hey, like, you know, I've been seeing this doctor. I don't like it's not really helping. Like, do you have any recommendations for anything? Because like this was the only option that he's offering and it doesn't really seem to be helping. So like. I just kind of, I was kind of going into of like, oh, I want to get a second opinion because Mm -hmm. it was like, you know, at that point I had been on it for about six months and was just kind of like, you know, at this point something should have happened and it wasn't. And so that's when she recommended uh, Dr. Spring Robinson. And so you were on Orlissa for a total of? So I was on it from October until May. 
So that would have oh. been about like seven months. Oh, interesting. For some reason, given what will come later, I was thinking it was three months because of what came later. Okay. Spring Robinson is like a really big specialist down here. And so it did take like a bit of time for me to get in with her. But if I remember correctly, I saw her at the beginning of May of 2022. So about like a, a little over a year ago or so. I want to get veer off topic for a second because as she's become more popular, which she's an amazing surgeon, she did my my second excision surgery and I had a great surgeon to compare that to. I had two very good excision surgeries. I was one of those because of COVID and other things, it came back uh, less extensive, but I knew what it was. And I've worked with her with so many patients, sending her as the second opinion doctor from doctors that I'm like, Meh, I'm not sure, but even really great doctors that people go to and travel for and spend, you know, a lot of money for their expertise. When they're local, they've gone to her and it's been an incredible experience. So you got recommended to see her by Merit. Did you do any other research as well as uh, the other doctor? What was your kind of research of them like and where did you find your information? Can you share a little bit about that? So for the first doctor, I did the basic Google type thing of like and San Diego endometriosis specialist. And um, this, I don't know if that's still the case, but this particular, you know, center and this doctor would be like the first one to show up um, along with ads from um abby <laughs> so um and i know that that's definitely still the case that abby shows up like all like that's gonna be the number one that sh- thing that shows up when you look up endo at least in my algorithm and i looked at you know google reviews and there wasn't that many but there was like you know a it was all like positive and on you know his like website um and this like medical center's website there was like more reviews on like his specific page again everything was pretty straightforward you know this person is like you know the head of this endometriosis department so if there's someone that it like looks good to see i'm like okay this is this is the person i was never really a nancy snook person um just because i had i heard you know many mixed things about the doctors that were from there and knowing that they're not really vetted by anybody aside from personal experience that was not something I used I know that that's definitely something that a lot of people do use but I just kind of did google (laughs) and then um when I was with Spring Robinson you know again kind of looking at reviews pretty positive she shares her practice with another doctor and so there's also reviews about him um and but their website had more information about surgery that's the Mm. thing that I remember is like it talked about, you know, the Da Vinci, like, you know, robot type thing, and definitely just had like, more information about that specifically, where there wasn't as much information about treatments offered um, on the other doctor's website. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Not having like, gone down the rabbit hole that many others have on Nancy's Nook, which is an incredible education site. I guess that makes sense for your story because you weren't kind of dedicated to that site as like the resource, the questioning of her ex- expertise because she's not on Nancy's Nook wasn't really a big issue for you. Yeah, I mean, it. I would say that because she was recommended to me by a physician that or like a person yeah. that I really respect who also had personal experience as a patient, because there's one thing for a doctor to re- recommend another doctor just because like they've met them before, or they've collaborated like that, you know, that yeah. can say something. But I think it's different when it's someone who has expertise in the era, and is a patient and has seen it from both sides that, yeah. you know, I just kind of took that as being a really, um, you know, positive recommendation, you know, whereas yeah. like, you know, other patients recommending people can definitely also have an impact. But again, they don't necessarily have the expertise yeah. of someone who is in that area. And so that's why it's been it's been so funny for me as a patient where pretty much all of my physicians who have something to do with my endo have been treated by Spring Robinson. So I have, you know, my ac- acupuncturist, my physical therapist, my mental health therapist, like everybody has both like has had their expertise and their own kind of sections and also been a patient and always has kind of positive things to say about her. 
No, that's so funny. I actually just put that together right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been a great thing for me, too, because, like, everybody's collaborated, and yeah. everybody talks to each other, and about my case and we'll kind of work together instead of it just kind of being an individual doctor to doctor or, you know, physician to physician, like kind of figuring things out independently and throwing everything at me. It's been a pretty collaborative effort, which has been really helpful. And also having just people who really understand what's happening to you and like your experiences makes like a world of a difference when you have, when, when you have something like this. Absolutely. And in your case, necessary. I mean, I remember talking to Lauren and it was so great. So many great ideas. Like, of course we can do this and let's strategize around this and how can we make this better? And hey, I've seen this scenario. These are the things that I've seen work. Can you try this? That was great. Yeah. Especially because like, you know, when I saw Spring Robinson for the first time, that was really the first time that I did have like such a I would describe it as like a primal reaction um, to, you know, it it became necessary for mental health to be mental health treatment to be overlapped with my medical treatment um, Mm -hmm. because they just kind of became completely linked to each other. Can you talk a little bit about your first visit with Dr. Spring Robinson and give some insight as to what exactly was that trigger, if you have insight to that. Yeah, so um, that appointment was interesting because it was also the first appointment that my partner Haley went uh, with me to because I, at that point, had really just been seeing people as like kind of maintenance care again, like acupuncture and this other doctor doing check-ins on the Oralissa. And so I knew that this was going to be a bigger thing because, you know, I knew that she clearly had a lot of information about surgery. And at that point, I had really started educating myself of realizing, okay, ablation was not the right fit. It looks like another surgery might be necessary. And so I just had a feeling that this was going to be like a bigger, more important appointment. And Mm -hmm. I can before that I I can definitely like forget things I can like disassociate in some ways where I can walk up at an appointment and be like I don't remember anything that we talked about and so I just wanted to make sure you know I had like my notebook of questions and I wanted someone to take notes and so that appointment was was interesting in our relationship too because at that point we had been dating for about like six seven months and so she had seen my day-to-day of what my experience was um but it from what she's told me was also like kind of validating to her because Mm -hmm. it was like there's a difference between like seeing something and hearing someone's personal experience versus a doctor validating it so I just remember like on the drive there I just started to feel weird and I had panic attacks my whole life um but not specifically related to medical things which is why I was so confused because normally in those environments I feel pretty comfortable I don't totally know what caused it aside from I think it may have been that I I did make like the mental kind of like check of like I'm gonna commit to attempt a pelvic exam so I Mm. think that could have definitely played a role in it but I Mm. remember like we went in there And I just started to feel so nauseous, like sitting in the waiting room. And there was like another person who came out who had like a folder of all the surgery stuff. And she was talking to her partner about it. So I was kind of overhearing it. And so I just went to the bathroom and I, cause I thought I was going to vomit. And I was just like, and I just like burst into tears and I was shaking. And like, it really kind of, it, there was no real prompt to it. It was just out of nowhere. So yeah, I just you know, went back out to the waiting room. And it's funny now having multiple appointments with Spring Robinson and asking her about what she thought of me in my first appointment. And um, she she says like that, you know, I just looked at you and I thought you're traumatized. (laughs) So because I thought I was like totally cool and calm and collected. But (laughs) according to her, I was shaking and stuttering and like Hmm. was like all over the place. And, you know, she's a surgeon, so she has a very, like, blunt demeanor. (laughs) Love her to death, but that was, 
she's learned she's definitely gotten a lot better with me but she's she can be a little she can be a little scary just because she is so knowledgeable and she she is like she specifically hearing about my experiences she got kind of angry about like what other doctors had done to mm-hmm. me essentially you know I tell my whole story I had my notes I had you know, these are all the symptoms that I started with. These are all the treatments that I've tried. I like wrote down like everything before my appointment because I was like, it, like I said, I just had this feeling like it was big. I, I know some people will go into it like who truly are like, this is going to be life changing. And like, they just like know, know it, but I just had like a feeling. And so I just wanted to go in as prepared as possible because I also knew that you know, some doctors won't believe me or some doctors, you know, won't understand the extent of things. And that was also part of the reason that I brought my partner with me because I've mm-hmm. noticed that doctors take me seriously or more seriously when there is someone there to validate me. I know it's different for, you know, heteronormative couples where there is a certain level of like misogyny involved where it they feel it's because their male partner is there. But I think for me, it was like, you know, it was just that someone else was there kind of corroborating my story. I love and, that you said that. Um, I think that as well. And I think that there is some truth to that. But it is so interesting that, you know, female partner comes in and even just noting how you felt, it'd be curious about other practitioners because that also could just be Spring Robinson. But I'd be curious, is there a difference of just like that validation external person there, whether that is male or female? Yeah. And and also having, you know, that was her appointment, first appointment with me. Since then, Haley has become more aware of what those appointments can look like and she picks up on things and she remembers things and like that was actually something that my my mom like first really noticed about her of like oh I like this this person for my child sort of thing was like that Haley remembers everything from appointments where I was you know saying to my mom like you know these are just what I'm gonna try now and the doctor was nice like Haley had like notes she was recording during appointments like and she remembered everything and could like reiterate everything back to my mom and also because you know we started to learn about my behavior during appointments from you know different diagnoses I got later having another person there to advocate for me when I might come across as you know very like disassociated I would say is the word like not totally present and like not totally aware of what's happening, like having someone else there to not only explain my behavior, but also play the role as like explaining why we're there and kind of like running the appointment has helped me a lot in terms of actually like getting somewhere with appointments. Yeah, she's a great advocate for you. I love Haley. Shout out to you, Haley. I know you're not here today, but shout out to you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, love her to death. We've now been together for like almost two years. So it's been it's been a long and she's been there like through like all of my major surgeries and everything. So with that appointment, you know, that was really the first time that Haley witnessed it. And that's been a kind of a a, a, was a turning point for her, too, because that was also the first time that she witnessed my attempt at a pelvic exam in our, you know, relationship, that was just nothing we ever attempted because I kind of day one was like, not happening. Sorry. And she was like, very cool about it. Like I've had other dating relationships where people weren't and that's where it ended. And that's fine. But like, she was very cool with it. So she there was never any attempt. So she didn't really Mm -hmm. see what that looked like. She was just taking me at my word for it, which is great. But again, it was like a kind of validating experience for her. Spring Robinson first off was like, get off of Orlissa immediately. <laughs> and she got really kind of fiery and passionate about that, um, about how I should never have been, you know, prescribed it at my age. She hates using that drug. And I do think she only will maybe in certain cases use Lupron because there is some evidence, mm-hmm. and I've seen it work a number of times, she hates doing it, and it's sort of a last resort when it comes to wanting pregnancy. So I want to highlight that this is not something she encourages as treatment for endo. We'll never consider it for that. But in certain extreme circumstances, I think it's one month in a very particular way in line with surgery and a number of other factors. So 
just want to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I want to emphasize, like, I have never seen a doctor get more passionate about something and like all of the doctors that I have seen. And she truly kind of illustrated her own anger about my experience. And she was really pissed that Mm -hmm. a doctor put me on it. She had understanding of who this person was. This is something he does frequently. And so she was really not happy about it. Yeah. Um, Get off of this medication. She explained, you know, this can put you into menopause. So there's other things we have to check and look for. And she also explained ablation was not a good option. That's just not the golden standard. And at that point, I had done quite a bit of research on my own in preparation for that appointment of, of mm-hmm. you know, realizing, okay, excision is the right next step. Um, but she, you know, did her doctor job of educating the patient about, you know, why that was a bad treatment and why, you know, excision is a good treatment. And then wanted to attempt a pelvic exam. And I had already kind of decided with myself, I'm like, okay, this is a new doctor. Maybe it's going to be different. <laughs> I would describe it as a level of delusion, to be honest, where I was just like, I'm going to try it. I had this feeling of like, I want to prove to this doctor that like, I'm a good patient, that I'm yeah. like, will try things and I will listen and, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, I got, you know, into the stirrups and all that jazz and Haley was next to me and, um, she said that she was just going to like attempt like a, like a digital exam, like nothing with like a speculum yeah. or anything. I just like remember, it's kind of hard to describe, but I always like to kind of paint a picture for people. I say that it feels like a hot knife because there's like this like cutting searing type feeling. And there's also this like crazy, like burning fiery type feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I just, it was like kind of like the exorcist where like my whole body like (laughs) lifted up off the table and my vision just went like completely black and I just saw stars like I wasn't holding back in terms of like I just really wanted to try it I wanted to see what was gonna happen and so you know I felt something inside at least I felt like I felt something inside okay I did it I remember I was just like I kind of came like back to and Haley looked horrified (laughs) <laughs> because I think I I don't know if I screamed but I probably was kind of like ah you know and yeah. I looked crazy and so that scared her Spring Robinson was like okay 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 like we're not, we're not doing that and so I truly thought I was like I did it we did it I know <laughs> I felt something like how far did you get in like how did it how did it go and she she I just remember this so perfectly she's like it was like this much mm, dang it I was like, oh, because <laughs> I truly felt like I like I accomplished something, like I committed and I did it, and it just like it, no. And so she brought up for the first time ever because I had heard vaginismus, I had heard vulvodynia, of course I had heard lichen sclerosis, and so she mm-hmm. was the one who's like vestibulodynia, go see Jandra, you know, like I don't know exactly what you have, but she's gonna be able to figure it out and like come up with next steps and she said that she didn't see any evidence of lichen sclerosis either having seen goldstein he doesn't believe that either but that was like the first time a doctor was like yeah i don't think that's the case for you basically walked out of that appointment being like i want to do excision surgery your symptoms are pretty severe we know based off of this previous doctor that you have endo because she was able i didn't have a biopsy or anything but she was able to like we know that there's something in there we know that there's ablated endo tissue in there So at the very least, if that's all there is, we want to get that out ASAP. Yeah. But she was like, you know, there's a strong chance that she didn't find everything that you have. You know, I want to get in for surgery as soon as possible. And so that surgery was about a month later, but it was before that surgery that I saw you for the first time. To just to go off of what she what you said about your exam, usually when she refers somebody, she'll give me kind of a brief update. Hey, sending this patient over. And I just remember her being like, I don't know what's going on, but something's not right. (laughs) And I don't know if I've ever shared this piece of it with you. I remember thinking in my head, she has neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. Like just immediately from the few things that she said, I'm like, this is probably neuroproliferative. And I don't think she really expanded on really describing anything. The interesting thing about neuroproliferative vestibulodynia compared to something like hormonally mediated 
is the vulvar tissues can appear pretty normal looking. They don't necessarily have a lot of redness or irritation, though they can, especially with hormone involvement on top of it. And you had been on several birth controls and you had been on Orlissa. So we saw a lot of atrophy, but I knew from the moment you laid on my table, we are not doing anything internally. Yeah. Do you want to share how your first experience was in my office, given that what we do is internal work? You know, I hadn't I hadn't touched on this, but I had had a previous experience with two different pelvic floor physical therapists. And so this was a very different experience for me um, in that, you know, the the PTs that I had seen before were very much in that boat of like, okay, prove to me you the only thing that's going to work is dilators, you just have to do it. I had a particularly bad experience with the one that I saw when I was a teenager, like younger teenager, who for the first couple of weeks was like, yeah, we don't have to do anything internal. And then at a certain point was like, okay, we can't do anything else except internal. And so she specifically said to me, like, if you don't want like the first time you experience penetration to be in like a doctor's office, then like you should get that taken care of basically. Thankfully that didn't cause any further like anything after mm-hmm. that, but I I came back to that appointment and was like, "Okay, well, we're also in COVID, so nothing happened. Like I didn't know what she wanted me to do, like go on Tinder and be like, I'm just going to find someone." <laughs> like I, I don't really know what her goal was behind that, but now you've made it weird. So now I'm not doing yeah. it. And so she's like, "Okay, well, this is something I can do to help you." And then the other PT that I saw was like we did some biofeedback which was interesting in terms of like learning how to relax the pelvic floor muscles that was interesting but again it reached a certain point where she was like we can't do anything else aside from internal work and dilation you know she gave me my first dilator went home tried it didn't work came back I was like it didn't work and she's like okay well there's nothing else we can do so it seeing you it was like that was the first time where it was like okay we're not going to attempt a pelvic exam you had an idea of what it was Whereas like every other time it was just like a blanket, like the vaginismus vulvodynia. And I I think that those can be like valid diagnoses for some people, but there's Mm -hmm. that fails to find the root problem. And so you just seem to like know what you were talking about and like actually have like, you know, I'm going to refer you to Goldstein and this is, you know, what it can mean. And like in the meantime, you know, we can't, we can't really do anything until you have this surgery, but like in terms of that issue, but we can do stuff with the endo. And so yeah. every every other pelvic PT, even though I had really gone to them for endo, was very focused on the vaginal type issues, whereas like that wasn't really the case with you. Yeah, there's so much more to it. External work, connective tissue restrictions, you know, which you often find in people with endo in and around areas that have been irritated, let alone posture changes. If you're 12 years old, 13 years old, you're having pain every month. What's the natural position? Fetal position. So there's there's several things you can do, whether or not it helps somebody. You got to go through a few sessions. Some people, it helps a lot. Some people, it really doesn't until after the surgery. But there are so many things you can attempt to, to do, at least externally, or attempt to relax pelvic floor muscles. I think about it as musculoskeletal issues can be a primary source of pain. In endo, that can be true too, but they can also be a secondary source of pain. So if you haven't found the root that's causing the pain, you're going to have the secondary effects, which are pain and tightness in the muscles, the connective tissue surrounding. So you can attempt, but there's a pretty short line where you're not seeing improvement. You know, it's not that I can't help you, but I can't help you right now. Yeah. And... So there was like kind of clear next steps and you had like ideas on like what to do leading up to surgery. And you also, I remember, kind of gave Haley some ideas, things that she could do to help with my movement during um, like recovery from surgery for like the first time seeing like a physical therapist. Okay, we have ideas that like are actually helping. There was a lot more flexibility in terms of like everyone else had been very rigid about they do the same thing for every person who has these issues. If that doesn't work for you, like, sorry, nothing else we can do. But you you had a lot more flexibility on what our options were, both before the endosurgery and after, and then also before and after anything to do with the vestibulodynia. Well, I'm glad. 
And also to note, which you haven't mentioned this, this probably is where I had more ideas as well, is you were having a lot of gait disturbances or walking issues. You were struggling with whether or not you should use a cane. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it definitely Mm -hmm. relates into all of this. Yeah. So I had seen some, so I had started seeing a new therapist is kind of where it started. Warren, my therapist, I love him very much. (laughs) He, I still see him. He's amazing. But he also has endo, saw spring Robinson is like, I've seen so many therapists throughout my life and I've never had someone figure out things as quickly as he did. So it was kind of crazy because I literally just found him like on psychology today. I just kind of looked like anxiety, depression, um, OCD is what I had been diagnosed with at the time. And like women's health and like chronic pain was basically like the things I put in there as a queer person. You know, I wanted to find someone who was like queer friendly, that kind of thing. So I had started seeing Lauren and he recommended the Bloom and Uterus group. Mm -hmm. And so it was there that I saw some people talking about using mobility aids just like in different scenarios. And so that's when it kind of first came up for me because I had a lot of restriction on what I could and couldn't do physically. So a, a really good example of it is actually Haley and I's first date. She remembers this. People are ableist. People don't want to be with disabled people. And that's really unfortunate. If they don't want to be, they shouldn't be because they're not going to be a good partner, you know? Mm-hmm. On our first date, I was walking off and I was having a flare up and I kind of will walk like a pregnant person. Um, I think mm. that's kind of the way that people can visualize it. It's just like a weird kind of gait where you're holding your stomach and you walk kind of slow and you have to take breaks. I was like very like embarrassed about it and like apologetic about it, but she was so like chill and open about it that was back in like november bef- like before all the this stuff that mm-hmm. we've been talking about and it progressively gotten worse where like i just couldn't get through a lot of my daily activities in terms of like walking around on campus was like impossible walking around the grocery store i was having so much pain but i at the time i couldn't really pinpoint it i just figured it was endo related and i was having a flare up i didn't really think about any additional issues and so mm-hmm. in that facebook group i had seen people talking about using canes in certain situations using wheelchairs using walkers when you're thinking about it it feels like you'd be taking a step back almost mm-hmm. and so there is always like it's pay for me to do this? Am I disabled enough to use something like this? And that's what a lot of the conversations were about. And a lot of the comments were like, oh, yeah, I've been using one for years when I do these particular activities. When I brought it up to my parents, they similarly were just like, you know, but you're not that sick. You're not that disabled. Like people see it as like something has to be really wrong for you to use something like that and so I had brought it up to you because I'm like okay if a doctor it gives me the go-ahead that makes it okay like Haley's always been supportive I don't really remember her having like an opinion about it it was mainly like yeah if you want to use it use it like compared to like other people in my life who were pretty weird about it thinking about it retrospectively so that's why I kind of brought it up with you was like, okay, well, if a yeah. doctor, especially like a physical therapist who's supposed to be working on this stuff or treating this stuff with me, like thinks that this would be a good option, then it's like, if anyone questions me about it, I have justification, I guess. Which is so sad that you even needed that justification, but very understandable. I want to make that clear. But I do remember Haley kind of being, <laughs> Haley's so funny in your appointments, her being like, see, I told you. <laughs> Yeah, she's definitely always been like the person to encourage me to accommodate myself, essentially, I in, in a variety of different ways. Having been in therapy for a while, I now know that I have a tendency to think about how my actions impact other people more than the average person does. Mm -hmm. And so in a weird way, even though I'm like purchasing it myself and like, (laughs) it's like, am I taking something away from somebody who actually needs it? And like the first time we really did something to like accommodate that was when I graduated, her gift to me was a trip to Universal. When we talked about going, it was like, oh, we can rent a wheelchair, we can get an ADA pass. I don't have to like stand and walk around and that was the first time in like 
years that I had truly like enjoyed an outing and like didn't regret it afterwards. And that was really her pushing me because, you know, there is like a weird thing in society about like a mobile person using AIDS. And I've definitely had like some funny moments, especially at places like theme parks where like I've noticed specifically international tourists will think like a miracle occurred when I like stand up to like go and like get on a ride like I've had a couple people be like 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 they've been like you know oh my god I'm not paralyzed anymore because people just see like that stuff is being you know you have to be paralyzed or you, you have to have like you know a limp or something to like be able to use that kind of stuff And so Haley really pushed me to do things in a way where I would be able to enjoy it and not think about what other people were thinking. Mm -hmm. Because I know my family's going to listen to this and they're not going to like that I said this. They like weren't cool about it at all. Sorry, mom and dad. It was tricky for them because I hadn't been living with them for a while. They weren't seeing my day to day and how things Mm -hmm. had worsened in the time since I had moved to California, they have like the idea of, or they did at the time, you know, you don't really need it. Literally, like you're using a crutch, like you're just you Mm -hmm. need to push through it. You need to deal with it. That's what made it like pretty hard. I had just started using the cane around the time that they came to visit for my graduation. There were particular members of my family who were very questioning about like, do you really need to use that right now? Like, why do you have to do that? Almost like an inconvenience to them or weirdly embarrassing to them. And I don't think they would say that that was the case. But that was like the energy that they were giving off. Yeah, your perception of it. And I'm sure it's complex. They don't want to see their child's looking disabled. And I'm sure that there's unconscious bias too of what other people maybe thought about them. We all have that. I think you express some of that too of, you know, when you see somebody that you or we as a society label as, oh, they're clearly disabled, they're paralyzed. It's like, do you diminish their diagnosis? because of your own pain. And I think that's a societal Mm -hmm. thing. And I think it's very common for us to think that way because of societal norms. But I think it's unfortunate when you talk to different people, probably their understanding would be like, of course, like they wouldn't say that to themselves, or they would be offended if somebody said that to them. But it is it is a society thing. And it in some ways, not just a disability, but an ageism issue as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that especially in the beginning, um, because it was around the time of my excision excision surgery, I also got a um, ADA parking pass. And I had a lot especially old people were like, not cool with it wouldn't be cool with it and like until they saw the cane we even had a a situation at a grocery store which we probably told you about it was Haley and I and we went to a grocery store it was like kind of late at night and we were coming back from a show like a comedy show it had been a long day I was tired and so I just wanted to use those like motorized carts Mm -hmm. and grocery stores grocery stores are big they're overwhelming like I don't want to be like walking around and also when you are using a cane you have one other hand to carry things that's like something people don't like ever think about it's helped me a lot like at concerts where they take your top of your water bottle I'm like dude I'm not gonna have any hands can you please just like give me the cap so I can put it in my bag people don't think about that sort of thing and so yeah I was using the motorized cart and in front of everybody one of the employees was like screaming at me like specifically said like are you even disabled and I was pretty out like it was late and I have a medical marijuana card I had partaken that night I was (laughs) I was kind of out of it but Haley wasn't and she got so angry. I like, and she like wrote an email to the manager and like called corporate <laughs> because like it was very much they probably saw us as like kids who were just like messing yeah. around and using things that they're not supposed to be using. The, the ageism thing is definitely mm-hmm. a, a big thing. People don't want to think of young people as being disabled. And if they are disabled, they want to think of them as someone with, you know, who was in an accident, who has cancer, or like just something that they see. Yeah. And that's just not the case. In- I hate people sometimes. Just be nice people. Yeah. And things have definitely gotten better over time or maybe it's just because I care less I'm not really sure like especially when you start using stuff like that there you feel very self-conscious that you are still questioning to yourself do I actually need this 
Am I using something that I'm not supposed to be doing? It's like once you feel comfortable or you see the benefits of it, it's a lot easier for you to explain to others who question you. I probably have just cared less. <laughs> probably. Let's talk about your surgery and some of the issues mm-hmm. that came from that. Yeah, so um, I had the excision surgery. It was, I'm going to be totally frank, a very traumatizing experience. <laughs> for me at the result of really nobody's actions it was really from complications and weird things that happened when I woke up they told me because I had had that IUD placed in my ablation about a year previous and so there was no plan to remove it going into surgery. Um, I was not anticipating that. I wasn't prepared for that or anything. But I remember in the first recovery bay I was in, the first thing they told me was like, well, I think I asked, like, did they find anything? And they probably said yes. And then the thing that I remember was them saying, oh, they took your IUD out. I was so out of it. I was so confused. I was really in and out. It took me like three hours or something to come out of the anesthesia. And then when I was in the second recovery bay is when things were explained to me a little bit more. They said that the IUD was placed incorrectly or that they found that it was in the wrong spot so they took it out. I didn't get a lot of detail until later on. They basically warned me there's going to be a lot of blood when you stand up because they don't put like a pad on you or underwear or anything and I will faint at the sight of blood. (laughs) So it was like hey as a heads up and then also after any surgery you have to pee before you go. That's when the the nurse told me, and like, by the way, your urethra tore. What the fuck? Like, I was so, I was so out of it, and I was incredibly confused. I had had this relatively good experience with my other surgery, where like, I didn't have any complications. The only thing was like the glue on the incisions, and Spring Robinson had already like, confirmed multiple times that she does not use that and so I walking into it expecting a very different experience than what I actually ended up having I remember like she helped me stand up and like the nurse was really nice and she said that she had had endometriosis surgery she was really nice and really patient with me and gave me a lot of tips and stuff like that but you know I stand up and my bed is just like soaked in blood there's blood like running down my legs which is just a startling thing for like anybody, especially when you're on meds and you're coming out of anesthesia and it's just, it totally threw me off. And then, you know, we go in the bathroom and she's sitting with me and she's like, I'm sitting on the toilet and she's like cleaning up the blood on me. And she's explaining, you know, it's going to hurt like hell to pee because it already hurts after surgery Mm -hmm. when you've had the uh, catheter in there. Like it's uncomfortable anyways. Having a urethra tear is the worst (laughs) thing ever (laughs) and it was just it was horribly painful but I eventually did it it lasted a couple of weeks where it was literally like I would avoid peeing until like I absolutely had to but again Mm -hmm. I was like what do you mean my urethra tore I didn't understand how that could have happened I also had a lot more incisions than I thought because when my first surgery I had the belly button like keyhole And then I had one other one, Mm -hmm. but this one, I had the belly button and like three or four other ones. So I had like a lot more incisions. So I was just incredibly confused. I was in a lot of pain. I was really uncomfortable. Having had procedures since then where they gave me good pain meds, they did not give me good pain meds. They definitely could have given me (laughs) something better. Yeah. So then I got in the car and my mom and Haley were here. And she's like, do you want to know what happened? And I was like, yes. And she's like, do you really want to know? Because you're probably going to forget. And I was like, yes. And I actually do remember this. The IUD was because they said that they found that the IUD was fish hooked into the wall and muscle of my uterus. Um, Because it's like the T-shape. And so one of the sides of the T-shape was like hooked into the like tissue and muscle of my uterus and essentially punctured it. The way that it was explained to me by Spring Robinson is that is something that occurs during putting it in. Like, that's not something that happened on its own. It's nothing that Mm -hmm. I did. When it was placed, the person who placed it did not double check it is basically what she Mm -hmm. said to me. And because I couldn't check the strings ever and, like, doctors couldn't check the strings because of internal stuff, I just had no idea. And that's I had a lot of spotting and stuff during that year. I had that IUD. 
but you know that happens and so that probably also contributed to my pain um and she said that she found it because you know when she went to do the hysteroscopy where they look into the uterus she also couldn't find the strings and so that how she found it and so they had to remove it which already causes bleeding plus basically they opened a wound you know when they say like if you get stabbed or punctured with something don't take it out because it's basically holding the blood in but when they take it out you know all came pouring out and they had placed the catheter and everything and they were about to start the actual excision part but someone noticed blood in my urine and that's when they found that my urethra had torn and I also had a lot of atrophy like you said around like the vulvar tissue and it explained to me that that's a result of the oralissa. It basically sucked all the estrogen out of my body. And so it made my external and internal tissue really fragile and like friable. Um, and so that was a continuing complication throughout the excision surgery because basically what they do is they'll grasp onto some tissue and then do like a blunt like cut. But when they were pulling, it was just tearing, like everything was mm-hmm. tearing. So that, you know, probably caused like some internal injury during the surgery. And then along with the the urethra stuff, she diagnosed me with stage two. I also had like pretty extensive endo based off of what I read could be stage three. It just, everyone kind of seems to have their own like idea of what the stages each doctor has a different thing but um it was found in a lot of other locations than what the other doctor had found it was found in the same locations plus one of Mm -hmm. the the big ones and the area I've seen the most improvement is that it was found in my rectum I had like chronic constipation and chronic you know gastrointestinal issues I had a lot of times if I ate something that I was really sensitive to, I just had no control over my bowels. And that was another reason I hardly ever left the house and like didn't yeah. ever eat outside of the house. So that's the biggest improvement I've had. It was, you know, found throughout my whole abdomen. My ovaries had atrophied again yeah. from the oralissa um, where they kind of like shriveled up is my understanding of it and my appendix was adhered to my abdominal wall I don't remember there being anything about any other organs because I know sometimes organs will like stick to each other and that kind of stuff I believe the appendix is the only thing that was adhered to anything and I had a lot of just like kind of scar tissue from the ablation and also from the oralissa where like I had endo, but a lot of it didn't come back as endo through the biopsy because it was just a lot of scar tissue from the previous surgery and the oralissa and also like just kind of as a result of the endo. That recovery was a lot harder because there was the mix of it being a more intense major surgery, dealing with the complications afterwards in terms of like the bleeding and the peeing and all that stuff. And then I also had like a whole hormone thing happen Mm -hmm. from having the IUD taken out and then I also now know that recovery is a sensory nightmare and so I was a nightmare like that entire Mm -hmm. recovery I was crying all the time I was super uncomfortable I had like no upper body strength in terms of like I couldn't like pull myself up and so I that was the first time I used a walker after a surgery That's like one of my number one tips for people because that's something people don't think about in terms of like a surgery recovery is, oh my God, get a walker because it helps you like get in and out of bed, on and off the couch, off the toilet. And it just like made, because you are just like hunchback, like whole, your stomach so bloated, everything like hurts. It was a very different experience than what I had before. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I think it's encouraging too that you don't have to feel that you're not fully handicapped to use some of these tools to help you make Mm -hmm. something easier and especially through recovery just do what you can to make yourself feel better there's gonna be things that people will tell you to do that just like aren't helpful it's difficult but if you have kind of the ability to really listen to your body and what your needs are just do what you have to do you just went through something pretty major and a, a, your body took a lot of trauma so whatever you can do to make your life easier just do it <laughs> it's, it's yeah. not worth not doing it to be honest yeah absolutely you know that recovery honestly took a long time especially in comparison 
to my other surgery. It took me a lot longer to kind of get back to my life, go through my daily activities on like a more normal basis. It was a pretty life changing things in, in terms of a lot of my symptoms. You know, through Spring Robinson, again, I was led to you and then to Goldstein. And so that will kind of lead into my stuff with Goldstein, the other stuff you figured out with the MCAS and stuff that my therapist figured out, because all of that pretty much happened in like July, like I had my surgery in June, and then like, everything else like changed after my recovery. But yeah, that was in in terms of the, the recovery, it sucked, it wasn't fun. But talking to other people who have had the surgery, who have tips on products to use, like there's so many things that people will think of, again, like the walker that you just won't, and like how much time you'll have to watch TV, to read, have your lists ready, (laughs) you know, everything, any source of entertainment that you can, and any comfort items too, like I was saying, of just do whatever you need to do, because it's hard on anybody, but especially if you've been dealing with this stuff for so long, or you have other mental health things, it's a difficult experience, but it ultimately is really rewarding. And it's, it's important to remember that because I definitely lost focus of the end goal a couple of times. Thank you so much for sharing that. We have so much more to talk about. So much more came after the surgery. Yeah. On part two of Shay's story, I really want to dive into unveiling your feelings around having been on Oralissa given the findings of this surgery, which I do think made this recovery different in a number of ways than the first surgery with the ablation because that was pre Oralissa. Mm-hmm. Who knows? We don't have a comparison, but I suspect that some of the recovery that was difficult was because of the complications that happened, but also just changes that were made in your body due to having been on Oralissa and not having been off of it for that long going into this first excision surgery. So on part two, I want to dive into that with you, your experience with Dr. Goldstein and unveiling neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. That was the diagnosis (laughs) and further discuss your recovery things that you've learned and advice you have for others, some of the research that you will be doing. So more Simon on Shay's story. Any last words? If you have, you know, what you think is endo or honestly any health issue, oh my God, get a second opinion. <laughs> there are so many times throughout, you know, my story up until this point that we're pausing at that if I had seen someone who was qualified, who was a specialist, who didn't have other motives behind the treatments that they're offering or the decisions that they make regarding my care, it would have made a world of a difference. And so I had to deal with a lot of consequences as a result of other people's actions. If you feel like something's off, it sucks. But doctors are people too. You can't trust everybody and listen to your gut. Reach out to the community. There are so many people, even again, without endo alone, there's tons of endo groups, but there's also for any health concern, there's going to be online communities and even local support groups who will have a lot of resources and will have a lot of advice. And of course, not everything's going to apply to you. But reaching out, getting second opinions and getting advice from people who have been through it or who really know what they're talking about is important. Even if you feel like really great about a doctor, it's always worth getting a second opinion if you have the means and resources too. Thank you for sharing that more on part two. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms, at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Endometriosis.